All right. Well, welcome, everyone. We're so glad you're here. Um, and with our panel of experts, such a big thank you to all of you. Um, I'm Becky Kayum. I'm a speech language pathologist and one of the co-chairs of the NAA PPA task force. And we will be working on different initiatives um, in the upcoming year to better help the needs of families living with PPA. Um, all of our panelists today are actually on our PPA and PPAOS advisory board um, with PPA standing for primary progressive aphasia and PPAOS standing for primary progressive apraxia of speech. Um, so a big thank you to um, all of our experts. Um, but before I have you introduce yourselves, um, I'd like to uh, introduce Lisa. Yeah, hi, my name is Lisa Waters. I'm also a member of the NAA PPA task force. I'm a speech pathologist and a PhD student at UT Austin. So that's the University of Texas at Austin. Um, and I think that's it for me. All right. I'll be, and I'll just add one more thing. I'll be monitoring the Q&A box for any questions that you guys have that arise. Um, Becky has a list of questions that people have already sent in. So I'll be kind of helping to follow up to those questions. All right. Thanks so much, Lisa. Well, we will move on to uh, introductions uh, from our panelists. So um, John, would you like to start? Sure, are we gonna introduce around the horn first or are we just gonna start? Oh, sorry, we'll do just introductions by each of you first in that order. And then we'll go ahead and start with the questions after that. Sorry about that. Okay, hi, I'm John. John. Oh, and sorry, yeah, I, uh, if you wanna say anything about yourself, where you live or anything about your PPA, that's fine as well. Okay, uh, hi, my name is John and I have PPA and I have kind of a unique variation of PPA and I'll talk about it uh, when I do my little presentation. All right, thanks so much, John. Um, Lauren, welcome. Hi everyone, I'm Lauren Wisniewski. Um, I live in Ann Arbor, Michigan. I work for the state of Michigan and I'm an NAA board member. Um, my father was diagnosed with PPA about 10 years ago. So um, he is what brought me to the NAA. All right, thanks so much, Lauren. Um, Jen, welcome. Want me to talk first? My name is Jennifer Lee and I am from Alabama. I was diagnosed with FTD with PPA in 2018. I was a English teacher and library media specialist for almost 20 years. So the irony of this disease has not been lost on me considering my background with the English language. So volunteering has given me the opportunity to move forward with this diagnosis and help as many people as I can. Thanks so much, Jen. Um, Marlene and Jim, it's great to have you here. Um, thank you. Hello, my name is Marlene and um, my husband, Jim, was diagnosed with PPA um, last summer. And um, I'm a retired music teacher and we live in Northern New York. Should you talk a little bit? Yeah, and so, so, so this way, um, see, let's see where you're retired. Yeah. So I'm retired. Um, I'm 64 uh, four. and, um, and from that, I, 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 so I just worked, I, I retired just right about a mile, couple of miles from there. Oh, uh, that. And, um, and we, I, I worked at, um, a nuclear plant in New York, and um, and I did um, all that kind of stuff to have. I just well, probably boys, that, but uh, but we have uh, um, five kids and uh, six and and or six grandkids. <laughs> and, uh, well, six like, grandkids. Well, I was trying to think. Yeah, yeah. How we had that, but yeah, and so. So we got a bunch of kids and, and, they, and they come over and help me sometime with my stuff. 
And so that's a pretty good thing for them. You know, and, and so, so they help me quite a bit. They'll, they'll tell me if I'm screwing up some on it, but that's about it. Thanks so much, Marlene and Jim. Marlene, did you have anything else to add to that? Well, he, uh, we wrote down that he um, used to do, a, he was a thermography and vibration specialist at the nuclear plant. And uh, we do a lot of outside activities, kayaking, camping, and going places. He really loves going places, so. Yes. Right, all right, <laughs> great to have you here. And uh, last but not least, Tim, thanks so much for being here. Thank you, Becky. I was diagnosed one year from the day with PPAOS. Um, confirmation confirmed with a PET scan, and I'm 45. Um, it's so sur so surreal um, that I'm not getting get to meet my grandkids. You may. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. You may. Right. Tim, we're the same age. And I know that part of processing it is feeling that. Right. But just know that four-letter word called hope <laughs> keeps you getting out of bed every day. Right. I try to have something to celebrate each day. Yes. We plan on gym living for a long time. <laughs> very right. positive people. Yeah. And I keep them very busy. Oh, she's, gonna, she's, she's gonna have me because I do all the all the dishes. So oh yeah, I can't, you know, he's gotta you know. <laughs> we don't even think about how long anything is. Right. And I married my high school sweetheart, um, and we have three daughters, 12, 14, and almost 16. Wow. Well, thank you so much, Tim. And actually, um, you know, what you shared with us um, really touches upon our first question that we've received beforehand. And so can any of you speak about mental health, emo, you know, your emotional um, kind of response to, you know, receiving the diagnosis or living with this diagnosis? Um, those of you, you know, living um, with PPA or PPAOS, but certainly also from a care partner's or communication partner's perspective. So would anyone like to comment? I see Marlene, yeah. Um, I would say that um, Jim and I believe we should always be staying positive and active and communicating with others is really important. Um, you know, right away, we let everybody we know, know that it's important for Jim to communicate with them, even if it's tough and he can't find the words sometimes, you know, That's he has true. some strategies that he's learned from speech pathologists. And um, I guess I think it's really important that the caregiver, uh, the caregiver has to be really important to the person. If you're someone without a caregiver, I think you need to find a caregiver that is going to really help you and be there for you and be your rock. Yeah. And, and another thing is get your, your, your um, sleep, and get, get that so you're don't tire. Because I notice it when, when I'm here, and and if I if I'm really if I'm tired, then I will not say you know I'm, I'll I'll try to say something and then I'll say oh I'm just tired I knew it you can tell it you know so that, that is a, a tough thing. Yeah. That's, that's... But yeah. we do a lot with our grandchildren. We moved next door to one of our daughters, and we have two grandchildren who are always over here. They're always doing things. We go to the beach, really interact. I have to make sure that when we have, we have big family dinners. Jim likes to try to retreat by doing the dishes and not talking to everyone. And I mm -hmm. say, those can wait. You need to go talk to people. 
you know it's it's yeah. just really important the yeah. communication part of it because it's the speech that you know you still yeah. got it yeah absolutely yeah. so staying connected socializing um jen yeah anything to add to that that is very important is a part for me and also a way that i found to channel my energy because at our age you're not supposed to be retired you, all your friends are still working so i found that spending time volunteering and being active with our groups like that we have where we meet um gave me a way to have a focus and not so much hyper focused on myself helping other people who were struggling with the same things made me realize that it was it was my choice as to how i reacted about this and sometimes we don't get sometimes we're not able to make choices for ourselves about what we have to face but we do get to choose how we want to move forward. And one of the greatest strategies that my kids have taught me, my teenagers, and we have a blended family of six, but my teenagers have taught me to always look for a better way to do something and to always be fluid and willing to change. Mm -hmm. Yes, such great thoughts, Jen, thank you. And also closing yeah. my eyes when I can't find my words. It's helped a lot because it takes one of your senses away and the words come more freely. Oh, that's great. That's great advice. Um, well, let me move on to the next question. Um, so we know that everyone with PPA or PPAOS um, has such a different experience, you, you know, in your symptoms and the way things progress. Um, but could anyone share, you know, since you or, you know, your loved one has been diagnosed, um, can you talk to kind of how things have maybe changed over the past couple of years um, or year? Do this and talk about it. <laughs> yeah, so when we were talking about um, our experiences and uh, it, it's work to speed and read speak and speak about that and uh he listed some that he's going to read off to you and it says yeah i get fr frustrated and and that can't then i don't speak at all and, smoothly you know, you know and 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 you know even if i don't know people and they're around i don't really want to talk with people like that you know so when it's like that, but but I'm I'm doing better, and I tell people, yeah, I want to have. And so because somebody was saying something, I said, and I just tell them, hey, I got this, and, you know, and 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 they said, oh, they said that most people don't know what, yeah. about what aphasia is. is. What, what mm -hmm. aphasia is, yeah. yeah. And, uh, and 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 then sometimes I do really well, and. Uh, when he's speaking when i'm speaking <laughs> yeah when i'm speaking and and um and uh and then where we do enjoy um traveling and with my wife and we like to do i do i like to do work and my wife my wife does too we do gardening work so so that's what was that kind of what you wanted or did you want to know resources that we feel are helpful Oh, um, I think that'll come up in a later question. Okay. I think, yeah, she okay. is, you know, speaking um, has maybe gotten harder. Um, you said, Jim, just sharing that with others, educating them, um, staying engaged in activities has helped. Um, before we move on to the next question, does anyone else want to um, share? Uh, do any of you have good speech days and bad speech days? And they're totally unpredictable. Exactly. You're tired. Yeah. You're tired. I, Very much so. Right. And also time of day matters. Yeah. Because I knew we were doing this tonight. I took a 
a nap, an early afternoon nap, mm -hmm. um, and built that into my schedule so that I would be ready. Right. Um, I take naps nearly every day as well. That really helps. Sure. Yeah. My neurologist has suggested them and also says that singing is a great way to help with your speech. Lauren, yes. That reminded me to, to add in a part of my father's story, which is um, he has never played an instrument before or been a very musical person, but as his PPA progressed, he really keyed in on me playing the piano. And so they have a piano that I used to play, um, but he started playing it and he would play patterns um, and just play the keys. And I think that was helping something cognitively. Um, and so that was a, an action or behavior that developed probably six or seven years down the line, but um, I think there was something in there that that was helpful for him. Um, and earlier stages, I would say our experience was similar to what's been shared so far. A lot of difficulty speaking for him, much more tired, um, still takes naps during the day. Um, and slowly his speech has declined, um, but he still has his key words and key phrases and can communicate with us. Um, and we certainly know what he's referring to. Um, and he, he bikes every day. He's always been a, a biker um, and staying active has been a really big part of his health and his life. Um, and so that's sort of his, his experience. Um, now, I, there are other pieces. I see a, a comment in the chat about memory loss. Um, so there's some memory loss and different behavioral um, actions, but, um, but you know, still happy and, and doing well. Thanks so much, Lauren. Uh, let me move on to our next question. Um, do any of you have a home practice program for your speech or language? And can you share a little bit about your home program and how it was developed? Anyone want to share on that one? Yeah, we can, I guess. Sure, sure. Marlene and Jim, yeah. Um, Jim goes to a speech therapist. We used to go twice a week, then once a week. Now we go once a month. And the speech therapist provides us with worksheets. We have, he has a bin of like worksheets that are like this thick and like this thick. <laughs> and uh, the worksheets um, have all sorts of things. Like, you know, I get used to and I say, well, today we're going to talk about synonyms. And so I'll say a word and he has to tell me a word that's alike, or I'll say, we're gonna do opposites. Or he has parts that he has to like read a, a section up above and then answer the questions. He has a ton of these worksheets and some are on your, uh, I've seen on different sites on the, you know, that you can get online too, but um, if you don't go to a therapist, but I think that those worksheets are, are really important. Usually we try to go out on the deck or somewhere where not have the TV going so that he really pays attention. Yeah. What do you feel? You feel those work? Oh yeah, yeah. Especially if you have the things like the grocery thing, and, and that, right? You have, you know, how what are you, how much money is you're paying here in that in that? Thing. Yeah, it's like so, a billboard, like an advertisement, and then he has to answer the questions. Yeah. It's, how many dozen of eggs do you get for so much money? And corn and stuff like that, and but but you mm -hmm. you have to pick. You got to really watch what you're doing with it. <laughs> you yeah, think it up, but it, it is. Some of them are conversations starters. Like if you had a superpower, what would it be? <laughs> okay, just different things to kind of stimulate. Like if language. you were a color, what color would you yeah. be? He tells me he'd be green. He tells me I'd be brown. <laughs> 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 
getting some humor into there. That's no, that's great. She's been working. Yeah, that's great. Well, no, and certainly I think, you know, as we do other webinars and whatnot, the topic of speech therapy and home programs is something that could be talked about for hours. So, you know, thank you, Marlene and Jim, for giving us your example. Um, I want to, um, sorry, John, um, earlier that I, I missed your message. I know that there are a lot of questions about causes of PPA um, and, and whatnot. Um, and so John, if you wanted to tell a little bit more about your story, and then I thought Lisa, um, if you wouldn't mind mentioning a little bit more after that about most cases of PPA um, being sporadic, um, I thought maybe that would be helpful to answer a little bit of that question. But yeah, John, let me hand it over to you. Okay, thank you. Uh, like I said, my name is John and I hope by sharing our stories today, we can learn a lot from each other as we continue along this journey together. I am 62 years old and started noticing episodic aphasia type issues back in 2013 when I was 53. Um, so Tim, a little bit older than you, but uh, young. I was still very young, I thought. I was, I was actually very concerned because my mother was facing major health issues. Um, and at the time we thought they were dementia and Alzheimer's. Um, well, so it took me six long years to get a correct diagnosis. And I think a lot of people uh, go through that uh, search process uh, and it can take quite a long time. Um, I think the biggest challenges I had in trying to find answers were that my symptoms were episodic. Um, they, my PPA isn't, hasn't progressed it's not continuous, it's episodic. I, um, I had an episode today, it lasts for about two hours. Uh, I wouldn't be able to talk right now if I had an episode uh, or talk well, I could talk, but not well. Um, so my biggest challenges were it's episodic and also I encompassed all three variants of PPA. Uh, I don't fall into one bucket. Um, and what was really challenging is that when I went to see doctors, it never happened. So I go in and see a doctor, tell them what's going on. And not that they didn't believe me, but they never saw it happen. Um, and I, I think initially the doctors I saw um, had very little knowledge about PPA. Uh, you know, most neurologists don't know about PPA, it seems. Uh, there isn't a lot of information shared, I think, amongst the medical community. It's, I think it's getting better and better. Um, truth be told, I found out more about my symptoms and what PPA was all about uh, just on the internet. And that's probably true for a lot of you. So what happened to me back in 2013, uh, I thought it'd be uh, beneficial for people to hear this. Uh, I first talked to my general practitioner. He referred me to a ne neurologist, uh, did an initial assessment with uh, MRI. Then I saw a clinical psychologist at Yale who thought I had ADHD, ADHD and he wanted me, gave me some medicine, I refused to take it. Then I saw an Alzheimer's specialist, did a battery of tests, no results. Meanwhile, I had a friend who had PPA, a disease I didn't know much about. So I did a lot of research online, was convinced that I had PPA and I found out the name of uh, her doctor, main appointment. Uh, but even after several meetings, I still had no answers. Uh, then I sent, uh, the doctor recording of me reading a research paper uh, when I was having a, an episode. And that's what triggered him uh, to do genetic testing, full-blown neuropsych exa exam, PET scan, MRI. And I was actually, uh, you know, I was shocked to get the actual clinical diagnosis, but I, I was relieved to know uh, what was happening to me. And that's probably true for a lot of people um, that go through this process. Uh, at the time I was still working, uh, but I was having difficulty uh, functioning uh, due to my PPA episodes. Uh, initially I went on disability and then had to retire. But I'm not one to sit around on the beach and relax. Uh, my wife and family have been incredibly supportive of my efforts to pursue solutions. Uh, I participate in the North, Northwestern University's Communication Bridge Program uh, study. 
uh, speech therapy study year long, and I highly recommend that. Um, I was for fortunate to have one of the best uh, uh, speech therapists in, in uh, I, th I think, in, in the field. Uh, maybe Becky's the best, but maybe, maybe this other person's the best too. Um, earlier this year, I joined the five-year study called All FTD, and I am currently pursuing admission to a research study at the Healy Center for ALS at Mass General Hospital. So I highly recommend uh, everyone investigate trials uh, that might be appropriate for your situation. The clinicaltrials.gov website is an excellent resource. Um, while there are no known cures for PPA, there are several organizations that have gotten to know that provide excellent information resources and research on PPA. Of course, the NAA and the incredible Beck PKM, uh, the Meslam Center at Northwestern University, which has been leading the communication bridge study, the Association of FTD, which early this year held a conference that includes several sessions pertaining to PPA, and Jen, you went to that. Uh, Everything ALS, which runs excellent Zoom webinars focused really on research. And that's where I found out about the trial I'm pursuing. Um, there's, there are a lot more trials going on in ALS than, than uh, PPA, I can tell you that. Um, so, and this gets to one of the questions that was earlier. Uh, you know, I'm very optimistic, optimistic that we'll find solutions, but it's, I think it's very easy to get frustrated. And to be honest, I, I'm very worried about the years ahead. Um, you know, when knowing pe people have had PPA and, and how it progresses over time. Uh, in addition, uh, for many of us, this may be a very challenging time in our lives because it seems like a perfect storm has hit us. Uh, you know, you get a diagnosis, you have to retire unexpectedly, which is a whole host of issues. Uh, we went through COVID, isolation and loneliness. Uh, there's been a correction in the stock market, soaring inflation, possible recession. Not exactly a stress-free life, right? Yeah. Uh, so, but I wanted to end on a positive note. Uh, there are numerous examples of people, people with PPA that continue to lead fulfilling lives using other parts of their brains. And we need to share those stories. Uh, in my case, I moved to Vermont during COVID, bought a pickup truck, designed and built two post and beam barns, adopted a loving rescue dog from Guatemala and skied a lot in the winter. Nice. So I hope you hear you enjoy hearing my story and uh, insights on how the disease has impacted my life. Um, and thank you very much. Well, that was excellent. Yeah, thank you so much, John. And certainly, I think you touched upon almost every single question, you know, that, that's <laughs> come up, which is which is great. Yeah, um, thank you so much. And I didn't know, Lisa, just because there are so many questions, just briefly um, being our, our main researcher here, um, is there a cure for PPA and um, what causes it? If briefly just talk to that. Sure, yeah. Um, so regarding whether there is a cure for PPA, uh, the answer right now, unfortunately, is no. Um, there are, of course, research efforts um, in various sites that are doing you know, the, the kind of basic science of figuring out uh, how to attack the underlying pathologies and things like that. But at this point in time, uh, the answer is no, there's just, there's no pharmaceuticals, there's no um, any other kind of, of treatment that will stop or eat or slow the disease. Now, there could be some pharmaceuticals uh, for certain types of PPA that will have benefits for people. And so it's important to talk to your neurologist um, and see if any of those medications are appropriate for you because you could experience, um, you know, some um, lessening of symptoms or something like that, uh, potentially. As to what causes PPA, um, I guess that's also related to the question of whether there is um, a, a medicine that your um, neurologist would recommend to you. So. There are two primary underlying pathologies that have been identified. Uh, one is an atypical form of Alzheimer's disease pathology. So even though the syndrome, the PPA syndrome that people experience is not 
the classic Alzheimer's uh, with the with the uh, primary memory loss and, and um, confusion and things like that. Um, the actual like proteins that are accumulating in the brain is the same type of protein. It's just kind of um, accumulating in a slightly different part of the brain that's causing the aphasia. The second most common type of underlying pathology um, is the same type of um, protein, the tau protein that you see in other types of frontotemporal dementia. And so um, the medicines that um, some people get for um, who have Alzheimer's disease, they, those medicines might be appropriate for some people with PPA. And again, not to stop the disease, but mainly to address some of the symptoms. Um, and then as I understand it, there's um, not, perhaps not med medicines that are specific to the frontotemporal uh, tau protein. Uh, although there might be other medicines that are just specific to your profile that your neurologist might um, recommend. Um, so always talk to your neurologist. They understand the ins and outs of medications and your, you know, every person's different. Your PPA is not the same as someone else's PPA. Your background medical history is not the same as someone else's background and medical history. So certainly talk to your neurologist and you can kind of figure out what might be the best course of treatment. Thank you is so that, much. Yeah, thank good? you, Lisa. <laughs> um, I know we really want to focus today's uh, questions um, for our panelists and your experience of PPA. Um, there are so many questions here about what is PPA medications a cure. So I thank you, Lisa. I think with that response, we certainly, you know, help to answer a lot of those questions. So let's go back to our panelists. Um, um, are there any types of specific like activities, um, you know, that you engage in on a daily basis or um, homework programs, this, uh, workshops, um, and, you know, depending on, you know, the type of PPA or PPAOS that you have, um, are there specific things that you do for your type of PPA? Um, so any, any thoughts on that? Sure, Jen. I participate in the Communication Bridge um, program that John was speaking to. And also, as I said before, my neurologist has suggested, um, and my speech therapist has suggested singing because it's an easier way of getting words out a lot of the time. And I go back to, to songs that I've known for since I was a teenager. And it's, it's interesting to see how easily those words come out when I struggle with others. Um, and also just doing things simply such as trying to keep a schedule for sleep and um, trying to do the things at the same time every day. And it is a regimen that everybody has to find what clicks for them and what works for them specifically. Such great points. Yes, Marlene and Jim. Um, our neurologist said that Jim should be working out with a cardio exercise like at least three times a week where he really gets his blood pumping. Um, and I guess I was doing some reading. It says you can rebuild your brain cells. If you really start doing that, you can, you, if you really start working out. And also our neurologist told us that he should be eating flavonoids. Fla there's a, you can look it up online. A lot of your like blueberries and things right. like that are good for you. And if you look it up online, they'll tell you that you actually have to eat quite a few of them, but blueberries, raspberries and things like that are supposed to be very good for your brain. So those are a couple things maybe some people want to look into. Yeah, diet and exercise. Rec yeah, talk to your neurologist about those things. Yes, thank you. Uh, yeah, any other of our experts want to comment? 
on that question. I move on here. No, sure. Let me go on to the next one here. Um, this one is for our um, communication partners. Um, do you have any advice for family members of a person with PPA or PPAOS um, who maybe um, doesn't want to go to therapy or maybe um, doesn't have a lot of um, recognition um, of some of their speech difficulties? Um, I'm not sure if, yeah, Lauren. <laughs> Yeah, I can speak to that. Um, that was uh, pretty much our situation. Um, I think we tried some speech therapy for my dad um, early on, but it just, it may not have been the right thing. It just didn't click. Um, and uh, he didn't seem comfortable with it. So ultimately from you know, doctors and neurologists um, cons consultation, of course, but just knowing him to that he had to find what was right for him. Um, and so mostly as a family, we found our own strategies um, to help him. And that would be things like um, he would ask us, he would ask us to repeat a word or we would notice that he um, was stuck on a word like like book. And so I would go over and, and get a book and then we would write out the letters of the word and practice it. Um, and so we would do that frequently. Um, he had, you know, different strategies, things he would write down and try to practice over time. Um, he likes to watch Wheel of Fortune and practice the letters and say the letters out loud. Um, so there were just strategies that I think he was more comfortable with um, and we were there to support him. So we would kind of back up what we noticed was catching on for him. Um, and then one other just came to mind was puzzles. Um, so he really enjoys doing puzzles and we would, um, we would make puzzles for him that either had words that he would practice or had pictures um, and pictures of us as family members and pictures of things that he knew um, or places he had been. So um, that was kind of a, a strategy. So yeah, our, in our situation, we just um, kind of worked it out without, without much professional help. Thanks, Lauren. And that's such a great point uh, that you make, you know, catering the activities for them and their personal interest to practice speech. Um, Marlene, I, I saw you had your hand raised. Yeah. Yeah. Um, some of the strategies that we've learned through um, our speech therapist can be used by anyone who has, um, you know, just wants to make their own home program. Um, one of the things that he's had to work at is like, talking around the words. So if I don't know what he's saying, I say you have to rephrase it and talk around the words until he can finally communicate to me what it is he's trying to say. Or um, talking with your hands is really good or pointing to things that, you know, or, you know, anything like that. And, um, and when he can't do a word, this is one thing I was thinking, um, is that when you're saying he couldn't think of a word, Jim lists the words that he can't say, or I list them. And then every once in a while I'll say, okay, um, in our notebook, let's go through and say all these words that you had difficulty with, okay. you know? You know, and that's one thing. And also we use a boogie board. I wish I'd brought it in here. It's like a little, a little board, actually. I bought it for grandkids. And you can, if you can't think of a word, I start <laughs> has spelling it. it. I start spelling it and, you know, and then you just hit a thing and it erases, but just starting to spell it, he'll, he, he can use, a lot of times think of what the word is if I just start it like that. Mm -hmm. And then that's a word that goes on our list because that's a word he struggled with. Like uh, he's had a lot of trouble with compound words, mm -hmm. you know? So compound words always get him, you know, like I'd say, well, what's that thing that we get our mail in? And he'd be like, oh man, what is that thing again? Yeah. You know? <laughs> I can get yeah. some, but it's like 10%. You know? you know, like post office, anything that's a compound word, he really struggles with. Um, sure. Also, you can get sure. like alphabet letters, like uh, the old fashioned magnetic um, letters, 
and try to spell out a word that way. If you can't think of the whole, if you don't have a boogie board, boogie yeah. boards are really nice. They're like little tiny boards like this oh, and funny. you write on it and then you just like, bucks. yeah, yeah. Jen hit the button and it just erases. Here. That's great. So it, it's kind of a, a neat thing, but those are some things that are, that are easily done that you don't need yeah. to go to a speech therapist for. And sometimes things work and sometimes they don't. He, he yeah. cannot do puzzles. He, he doesn't like doing puzzles. Mm -hmm. So puzzles do not I, work for him. I used to. He used to love them, well, you know, so yeah, one person, yeah. one person won't good. work for another, but you can kind of play around with it right. and, and see what does work. In for the newspaper, yeah. crossword. Oh, yeah. crossword puzzles. That's another thing. I went online and I bought um, crossword puzzles and word searches that are extra big so that, because one thing is it's hard to see the tiny little words, but um, we bought the, and like, if we take our granddaughters swimming to their swimming lesson, uh, we sit up there and we do word searches together. Mm -hmm. Or if he can't find one, he'll let me look at it and I'll say, it's in this area. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Well, and I think the theme that certainly is coming up between all of you is um, personalizing the exercises, right? With words that are important to you, activities that are important to you. So that's such great advice, I think, for our audience. Um, I'm going to pass over um, to Lisa. I think I saw one question here, um, just the difference between apraxia and aphasia. Um, so, you know, uh, so, uh, Tim, would you be comfortable um, talking at all about apraxia of speech? Yes. Uh, apraxia is when you know what to say, the words just don't come out. Aphasia is where you don't know what to say. Hmm. That's such a good way of putting it. So, right. so, so yes, yeah. Or apraxia is more the motor programming for speech. Right. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. So that was one question, but let me hand it over to Lisa. Um, we'll move on to um, the Q and A uh, box here today. Yeah, we have a question um, from Susan and she's interested to know if anyone would be willing to share what goes on internally when a person with PPA uh, is asked a question, but maybe they don't know how to respond or can't think of how to respond in the moment. Um, so can any, does anyone want to speak to what they experience internally when they're having that difficulty? Jen, how it feels. Yeah, Jen, I see you raised your hand. One of the things we've come to call it is kind of like, I feel like my brain is buffering. Um, it feels like something's on the tip of your tongue but it's kind of like on the tip of your brain and you can't find the right word to plug in um it's very frustrating as you can imagine but every everyone that that i live with and everyone that's a part of my life knows to just give me time sometimes they'll ask me do you mean this or do you mean that and if i shake my head no they'll give me time or they will, you know, just start handing me stuff. <laughs> like, okay, do you need this, that, or this or that? And then sometimes I get frustrated, but they know to um, just let me have my frustrational times because it's that way for anyone that's dealing with any type of long-term diagnosis. So, I mean, you just have to allow yourself some grace um, and, it's the same thing my husband and my kids tell me all the time, quit being so hard on yourself because we are often so much harder on ourselves than other people are. And you feel like other people are depending on you. But unless you are being productive and being happy and being included, then it's it's harder not to be hard on yourself, if that makes sense. So the easiest way to do it is to break that circle and have people in your life understand and talk openly and honestly and not hide from it. And that's hard to do, especially when you have fears like I'm gonna embarrass my children 
I'm going to embarrass my grandchildren. And that was the hurdle I had to get over was that I was afraid I was going to embarrass someone that I loved. And then because I have teenagers and young adult children and they're not worried about it. So why should I be worried about it? Yeah, thank you, Jen. I really appreciate that honest answer. Would anyone else like to share anything about their internal experience when having difficulty? Okay. Well, I'll turn it back over to Becky. Sure, absolutely. Um, let's see. Uh, I'm going back. I think we answered all the pre-submitted questions. Um, any uh, suggestions uh, regarding uh, like financial assistance, like any financial planning that you've done, um, re you know, regarding your PPA or um, your loved one's PPA? No, sometimes a social worker can help. I know to answer that question. Yeah, sure, Jen. The only thing that I can speak to is my personal um, part. I definitely was not ready for retirement at 41, especially being a teacher. Um, and nobody tells you that how to prepare for that at that age, thankfully. Um, Things worked out for us, and I had a had put it put safeguards in place with like I had a long term disability policy in place through work and things like that, so that I was prepared for something catastrophic to happen. But I didn't plan on something catastrophic happening. So no matter what you put in place, it's hard to prepare for retirement at forty one, and when you're going to all these doctor visits and specialists and trying to figure out what's wrong. I mean, you go through money pretty fast. Um, I think everybody here on the panel knows what I'm talking about. And, um, you know, you just go jump through the hoops and do what you have to do to um, achieve what the outcome desired is. And I said that backwards sorry, um, and get put in place the safeguards and you just have to wait it out and go through the process. But definitely finding someone, a social worker or someone that can help you know how to navigate that time because it is so confusing. Yeah. Your doctors don't even really know what to do most of the time for that. It is definitely time to get some help. Thank you, Jen. Yeah, John, do you have something to add to that? Yeah, my experience when you ask the doctor, they, they don't have any answers on how to deal with your financials. Um, the key is really to have long-term disability um, in place and you need to have it in place early. Um, you, you don't qualify for long-term disability if you, if you have a diagnosis. Um, and the other challenge with long-term disability is not transportable. So most people get it through their employer. Uh, if you switch jobs, you need to uh, re-up it with a, a, a new employer. So it can be kind of cumbersome. You can go out and get private long-term disability, but it's much more expensive. Um, but especially for younger people, um, you know, it's long-term disability insurance is fairly cheap. Uh, and, and uh, you know, it's definitely something that's uh, important to have, whether you have PPA or not, uh, anything that could happen in your life. I can also chime in a little bit. Um, my father qualified for total and permanent disability as well. Um, and then began collecting social security um, thereafter, but I, um, I know that it was very important for us to communicate with a financial advisor 
early on and explain the situation um, and find that right person who understood um, and that you know we felt we could trust and talk to, um, knowing that the situation would change over time. Um, so those were a couple of kind of key things in, in our circumstance. And then um, my mother had a uh, power of attorney pretty early on as well. Sure. Thanks so much, Lauren, for those thoughts. Um, I know we're down to our last five minutes. So I don't, uh, I know we didn't give anyone time to kind of prepare your thoughts on this question, but um, are there any, is there anything that you would want to share as we're wrapping up um, with the audience? Um, one thing about your PPA or PPAOS you would want people to know or advice for others. Um, would anyone like to um, share that as we're wrapping up here? Um, I mean, I was just talking about a lady the other day. And, and, uh, Do you want to talk to them? Yeah, Marlene. Yeah, Jim. <laughs> Uh, just just the other day, I was I, my wife is getting her, her hair done, and and um, right, and uh, and so with that, I was sitting out on a on a bench, and a lady was talking with me, and then and then I said I, I said um, I can't say things sometimes, and and she said well, then she started telling tell me what it is, and I said I told her and she she never heard about it, of course, but but yeah, but it was nice to talk, and and she said. You know, nice thing. I just, I just said, yeah. And I said, it's, it's just, just a thing. You know, and, and uh, uh, that's how yeah. we look at it. We don't. There is one thing that's kind of changed. Is I have to do most of the driving now. He drives anywhere close to where we live, but if we're driving like up in the highway and we're going into a city, yeah. I do the driving because I'm worried that he's going to get confused or, you know, something's not going to, you know. Yeah. So it sounds like, you know, kind of final thoughts, um, telling people being open about your PPA, your aphasia gem has really helped. And then Marlene kind of figuring out, um, you know, some of the roles that maybe you used to have, Jim, how do you work as a team now to maybe split those up a little bit? Um, I know that can, can be challenging. So no, thank you for sharing. Um, yeah, anyone else, any final thoughts? I know we've also had questions about um, if someone can't understand you, you know, what would you like them to do to help you? You know, how should they respond? Um, that was another question we had, if, if that would be a good way also to kind of wrap things up. So um, anyone else have final thoughts here? I just think we should always, oh, sorry, John. Go ahead, go ahead. I think we should just always be patient and be kind and remember to stop and think of how we would want other treat people the way that we would always want ourselves to be treated and to remember that everyone has value thank you jen yeah, yeah john actually, yeah i just think it's important that everyone be an advocate for themselves um when you go see a doctor um you know they've got a thousand patients and um you need to everyone and their family members need to uh, do the work and, and, and uh, explore the options and, and be proactive. I mean, you've got it. The only way, way I'm finding out about trials really is, is on my own. I'm, you know, my, my neurologist is not telling me about trials. Yeah. So be an advocate for yourself or right. for your loved one. Yeah. That's such a, no, I think that's a great final thought of advice for people. Um, Tim, did you have anything you wanted to share as we're wrapping up? Um, <clears throat> I did voice banking and that's where you upload it to the cloud and then you download it from a cloud to a tablet. That way I can, <clears throat> I can speak in my own voice. Oh. That's right. So voice or message 
message banking, if anyone wanted to look that up. Yes, thank you so much, Tim. That's great advice. Um, and I guess, Laura- I'm just anything? lucky you had the time to do it. Yes, yes. Well, that you took the initiative to go out and start that process. I know it's not easy. Um, thanks so much, Tim, for sharing that and for, for being with us. Um, Lauren, is there final words or thoughts here as we wrap up? Similar to what John said, um, you know, we, as a family, we really wanted to be advocates for my dad and help him be an advocate for himself. So we always try to learn as much as we can. It's really powerful and really means a lot to us to learn from others. Um, so we, we are always happy to, to hear stories and connect and share our story. Um, and then if I can end on one thing, um, it's the story of my son, um, my, my father's grandson, of course, and he's six now, um, but he's only known my dad um, with PPA. And um, it makes me emotional because I, I know how much my son knows my dad loves him and they have such a strong bond and he didn't need many words for that to happen. So um, it's just a really powerful thing. And, and it certainly doesn't take away anything from the person. Thank you so much, Lauren. That's such a beautiful way to wrap up. Thank you. Um, and thank you so, so much to all of you for being here with us, for sharing your thoughts, your advice, for being so open, you know, with your thoughts. I know everyone in the audience and people who will listen to this recording afterwards um, are so incredibly grateful that, that you were here with us tonight. So many thanks from, I know, Darlene Williamson, uh, president of the NAA, and certainly all of us of the PPA, PPAOS task force. Many thanks. I also just want to mention that if your questions weren't answered out loud, I encourage you to check the uh, Q&A chat because it may have been answered in a typed message. Um, so I'm going to leave the room open for a little while in case there's anyone who needs to go into the Q&A chat box and look over their typed answers. And then I also want to say thank you to everyone in our panel for joining us today. It means so much um, to us that you were here and able to share your story with us. Um, and finally, I want to share with our audience that we will be having our next Ask the Expert webinar. And this is with a speech language pathologist, Brooke Lang, um, who will be discussing practical and affordable ways to build a home practice program. Um, showing you ways to incorporate your, incorporate your environment and utilize the tools available to you. Um, the National Aphasia Association also hosts many online groups. And so if you're interested in joining some support groups, um, these are all done online. Um, please feel free to email me um, if you'd like to join any of them, and I will definitely get you some information on that. Um, and then that's just about it. So thank you everyone so much for joining us today.